Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this um, second webinar on uh, COVID and smoking. Um, hopefully, um, just trying to launch my slides. Hopefully, uh, most of you managed to attend our webinar last Thursday on COVID and smoking, which uh, uh, was a really interesting session looking at the clinical evidence around smoking and COVID and um, some of the communications work that we've been doing around um, quit for COVID and um, a great example from Sheffield. There were so many good examples of what councils were doing in the current environment that we um, decided to hold this second webinar um, to go into that in, in more detail. So I'm delighted that we've got so many fabulous examples to talk through this morning. So, um, this is the agenda for this morning. Uh, we'll move on swiftly to, to hear from Newcastle City Council and then um, from the other councils um, on the agenda. And then we'll be joined in the Q&A um, by Martin Wilmore from Public Health England. So uh, that moves me on to remind you, um, those of you who've not used our webinars before, there is a uh, question tab in your um, panel on the right hand side. Please do ask questions um, throughout the uh, webinar. Mostly we will answer those at the end in the Q&A session, um, but do add uh, questions throughout. And if we don't get to our, um, answer them on the webinar, then we will certainly answer them afterwards. Um, just a couple of other bits of um, housekeeping, just to say thank you to everybody that completed the short survey that went out on, on how stops working services are being delivered at the moment. That's been very valuable and really helped us to identify some of this practice for this webinar and beyond. Um, we will share a summary of um, the results from that shortly as well, um, if people are interested. And then a couple of other planned um, events um, for the future that we don't have dates for, yet um, but the NCSCT guidance which hopefully people have seen um, is now out uh, guidance around remote consultations there's a link to it there in these slides and we'll, we'll circulate it um, after the event as well we're going to get people along from NCSCT to answer your questions on that guidance uh, at a future date um, so uh, watch this space and we also know that people remain interested in this grow in the growing evidence around smoking and COVID. And there, I, I urge you to have a look at the, the living review, which um, uh, Jamie Brown and others are uh, collating at UCL, which is at, at the link here, which again will circulate after this event. Um, we will get them on at some point to do a webinar to talk through what the evidence, the epidemiological evidence is showing on smoking and COVID and probably revisit some of the clinical stuff as well. Right, let's crack on. So we will start with um, Linda um, from Newcastle Council. So Linda is going to be talking to us um, about the work that they've done to adapt their services and encourage NHS staff um, to support um, people quitting smoking during the COVID outbreak. Um, and um, due to technological issues, I'm going to be moving um, Linda's slides on for her. So I will um, hand over the audio to Linda now and um, we can kick off. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Seary and I'm a public health specialist in Newcastle upon Tyne. And I would like to take you today uh, and just give you some background, first of all, if we could go on, Hazel, to the next slide, um, to the background to our work for COVID. And um, this obviously um, for us, um, Hazel, could you, that's great, thank you, beg pardon. And um, this is a long established um, uh, partnership between Public Health and Newcastle Pontine Hospitals Trust. Um, about we've been I've been working with um, preoperative assessment now, now for about three years, and um, we've had a pathway in place and a protocol for um, uh, high risk patients. And um, there's a high patient throughput um, in Newcastle. There's about two and a half thousand people through pre elective surgery um, clinics, and. Uh, approximately, you know, 30% um, of them are all respiratory related and uh, up to 20% are smokers. So um, we've um, got our work cut out for us. But we support, we support patients pre and post-surgery, but they start their quit journey 
um, in the pre-op assessment, you know, and we've trained all the staff. So we've got we've got things in place is really what I wanted to confirm to you um, and I've listed everything so I may not refer to everything but I wanted to actually list it for you to know that it was in place at the time could we go to the next one Hazel please um, on the 23rd of March well you know that was lockdown uh, electrical electrical elective surgical operations were cancelled or postponed most clinicians were moved, um, redeployed to support patients where they were most needed. And yes, it's a harsh reality. If you're a smoker, you're more likely to get acute respiratory infections and have a higher risk of those infections becoming severe. And the arrival of COVID-19 highlighted um, the risk to smokers. And I know it was early days, it seems a long time ago now, but it's uh, um, very strange. But by the 24th of March, no patients were in the clinic and it was closed. The same morning, I, um, if we could move to the next one, Hazel. Um, the same morning, um, I received um, an email um, and then a phone call from Dr. James Prentice, who is a consultant anaesthetist um, who uh, runs the clinic. And um, he was worried about staff who smoked and he said well we've the clinic's closed so but actually I'm really concerned around you know what what can we put into place for um, our staff who smoke who may be you know their anxieties may be you know on the rise we don't know the exact number who smoke um, it, we're trying to find out um, over the time but we we're in the middle of that when COVID struck um, but we know there's over 14,000 staff members um, we know that at that time there was emerging evidence around respiratory health and the, uh, the effects of COVID-19, so it was really difficult. Um, but we wanted to support staff, and we, you know, uh, we're always open to new suggestions and um, and ways of working. So um, we wanted to make it as e easy as possible, respect all the social distancing measures, and encompass the need for behavioural support and ongoing support. Um, and then actually provide vouchers. I say varenicline, but I, I actually, um, in this instance, it was mainly NRT. If we could move on, please. Um, so um, what we have in Newcastle is a hub service. Um, there's not that many people in it, about 10, um, and they're not all um, full-time. We have an outreach service, which is a community health trainer team. Um, they already deliver, they're fully trained and they're, you know, really expert, but they deliver a lot more than that. And uh, they deliver mental health support, exercise on referral, all the physical activity, the nutrition, all of that. And then we have 63 out of 65 pharmacies signed up to deliver Stop Smoking all to varying um you know performance of course and but I, you know that was the time when the the pressure on pharmacies i know it's alleviating a little bit now but at the time it just seemed to hit them um really hard and there were concerns around how could we actually um continue the service so the question we asked ourselves who was best placed to provide support to the staff from the hospital I contacted the community outreach and service and discussed it with um, the chief executive um, and really we had dedicated support, you know, within in place in two days, we had uh, a dedicated email, a dedicated phone and a dedicated worker. Um, if we could move on, please. And to be to be fair, that actually shows how really flexible and adaptive they are. Um, so what we did, we we actually thought, well, how to get to everyone. So an email was sent out, and this is the exact copy of the email that goes out weekly now to staff. So um, this is. So I thought I'd just paste it in for you. Um, it's actually um, a weekly e email out to all staff, and it's on the chief executive's daily blog. Um, which we found very useful. And then we had great help from Fresh Northeast. If we could go to the next one, please. Um, and could we go to the next one, Hazel, please? Hazel, could we go to the next one, please? Sorry, thank you. Great fun. Um, 
and they quickly um, uh, did this, and I'm, I'm happy to send it round to um, uh, send it down to Ash. But the thing is, it's just a two-sided flyer. It went out with, as an attachment to the email, and um, it was uh, a, a, the consultant anaesthetist actually, you know, communicated it to different departments and. Um, uh, really, we've had you know really um, nice response from it. Um, if we could go to the next one, please. The process seemed relatively simple. Staff can email the Stop Smoking Plus service. We have a dedicated advisor who picks up the email and contacts the member of staff at a mutually convenient time. Um, and over a full, over the phone assessment is completed and pharmacological support is also discussed. The relevant voucher if needed, and this for this period, um, we provide them free whether the person is eligible um, to pay for um, NRT or uh, whether they even live in Newcastle. Um, it's just not relevant at this moment in time, um, but the required voucher is then posted out to the individual and sent to a pharmacy closest to them or where items can be picked up. Um, I have to say that in some cases, um, uh, really, it, it, our health trainers have been picking it up from a pharmacy and actually delivering it to the person's door and, you know, putting it on the step and then moving back to the gate and then contacting the person saying it's on the step for you. So it's, it's really we're, we're respecting all the guidelines um, and, and the advisor agrees with the client the best time to ring them and provide ongoing support and encouragement. Um, I think if we could move to the next one, Hazel, please. I think um, post-COVID-19, um, we've had, I saw written the other day, this was a surge in motivation. I think that's probably right. People have, you know, a bit anxious and fearful about it. So it, it's it's awful to say, but it's, it's an opportune moment to actually, you know, um, help people support you know and support them to quit smoking because that is really important of course but as we develop the model you know the one-to-one -one support is actually not happening it's remote support but that has become a really um, important tool in our box and in the future we're now looking at developing the model we're going to encompass the media the zoom the facetime we're developing an e-voucher scheme which seems relatively easy um, and that would be help people and we're looking at direct supply for um, of NRT particularly for vulnerable groups and pregnancy and pregnant women. Uh, we also think that the remote support could work um, certainly through media on um, for groups and supporting peer mentoring um, and health works are particularly good at that they do it on all sorts of um, uh, uh, for all sorts of people at the moment, which is really good. Face-to-face -to -face support will still be in the toolbox, but actually, you know, when will that be possible? We don't know, and it won't be suitable for everyone. So it's around having a toolbox of, we've had to respond, and we would want to always respond, but actually we will keep that for, I would think, well into the future, you know, um, and I think it's really an interesting um, time and the fact that such a negative time and yet it offers opportunities to support people, which I think is really encouraging. And we are obviously dis uh, discussion or discussing already how we can continue supporting staff. Um, that's us, and um, email every you know my emails are available. I can send a fly around. Um, so um, hopefully that will be helpful and just outlines what's been happening in Newcastle. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Have Thanks, I timed it? Have I, have I timed you it all right? Spot on. <laughs> Um, that's great. I encourage people to add some uh, add questions to the bar. We, I can see we have a few coming in. There seems to be a couple of people having some problems with sound, so uh, Robbie will pick up on, on that. So we're now going to move on to Zahira, who is the service manager at Leicestershire County Council. And Zahira is going to talk a bit more about delivering services remotely, which is something that Leicestershire have actually, we're ahead of the curve on this one. Sahira, so we'll hand over to you. Thanks, Hazel. Um, a very good morning to everybody. Um, as Hazel said, I'm Sahira Chatra, and I head up the Stop Smoking Service and Weight Management Services um, 
for Public Health Leicestershire County Council, but I'm also the Tobacco Contri Control Lead for Public Health as well. So I'll talk you through um, about our experience to date um, in terms of our digital service. So most of you might be aware that we went um, digital uh, on the 3rd of January, 2017. Um, and so primarily a lot of our support is uh, done for general population by the telephone, but we've also got texting, email and live chat facilities available as well. But we, um, under normal circumstances, um, pre-COVID would um, provide face-to-face -face support for specialist um, services such as pregnant women, um, your people with mental ill health or vulnerable communities. Um, so being a digital service, we've got obviously a Skype um, service or a platform uh, to provide digital support. Um, and we've also got a patient management system that diarises sort of all the appointments um, on, a, on, a, on a patient management system. Um, and all our advisors have had their own laptops and the option to work from home even before COVID came in. Um, we provide all of our nicotine replacement therapy and e-cig um, via our local authority, via County Hall, and it's all on site. And we've also had a Champix PGD in place for pharmacy services um, since 2017. And I'll go on to talk a, a little bit more more about that in a bit. So COVID preparation then, uh, Leicestershire County Council uh, members and senior managers um, recognise that the stop smoking services needs to be a priority service. So very much a common sense approach um, because we looked at the virus, we said it's a respiratory illness and so it was recognised that obviously at that point that smokers are probably going to be quite at risk. So um, we were business as usual, um, so to speak. So um, we took a team A, team B approach in terms of staff members uh, coming into the office. So team A consisted of two members of my team um, physically coming into County Hall um, to provide the postage and to sort out NRT, et cetera. And I'll talk about that in a bit as well, with the majority of my staff members all working uh, remotely and from their homes. Um, in terms of comms engagement, we looked, uh, again, we started quite quite early on um, with uh, regards to um, recruitment of uh, smokers into the service. We did a lot of Facebook advertising. We used our social media posts um, and platforms. Um, and we also did partner communications, in particular uh, to our primary care services, so GPs, pharmacists, just letting them know we are open for business as usual. And um, interestingly enough, GPs themselves were quite proactive um, with COVID and at the very early on sort of stages sent out letters and text messages to all of their smoking patients just notifying them about I suppose the importance um, if ever there was a good time to give up smoking perhaps now it it, it was so you know um, encouraging people to come through the to our service. Um, we've just done a text out as well to all um, service users who set a quit date during uh, this period of COVID. Um, we were quite interested um, in hearing the experience, what made them approach the service and want to stop um, in particular around COVID, any issues, etc. So comms is busy working with that um, as we speak. And then of course, when the national sort of quit for COVID uh, messages came out, we've um, used that or added that onto our, our comms as a hashtag, um, but also um, yeah, just reinforced um, the risks around, um, you know, COVID with um, smoking etc. So team A then, um, so the two members of staff who are coming into the office would be looking at um, sorting out the NRT and e-cigs and posting it out to the service users. Um, Champix PGD provision, we've always had um, basically sent out text by vouchers to patients that they can take to their um, pharmacy. It has a unique voucher code number, and then they would be able to get the Champix off their pharmacy, and that cuts out the GP or having to go by the GP. There are some people who are obviously not legible by that PGD, so they would have to go via um, their GP services. So we would then email a, a letter of recommendation out to service users that were not eligible for um, pharmacy. 
use your prescriptions through pharmacy. Um, the e-cig uh, starter packs and liquids, we still uh, do it via recorded delivery so that it's track delivery. Um, very early on, um, sort of uh, mid-March, end of March, we've um, had some issues with supply of NRT from our supply chain. Um, but luckily for us, we could partner up with our neighboring Stop Smoking City, uh, Leicester City Stop Smoking Service. So sort of helped each, uh, help, they helped me out um, for, uh, as an interim measure, as a one-off, but you know, um, they were there when we needed them. So thank you, Leicester City. Um, so going forward, I would recommend that we look or commissioners look to build in postage into your budgets really. Um, so if ever we are um, embraced with situations such as this, um, you know, you, you've, you've already um, put that into your budgets um, in terms of posting out of NRT, et cetera. And I think um, our experience has shown that, you know, posting it out from base um, is, is, has been cost effective. Um, we save on mileage, we don't need people going out to post it through letterboxes or using third parties, et cetera. Um, so it's worked well. Another tip I'd probably say is um, set up and use SharePoint. Um, so SharePoint is a web system for, if you don't know, um, it's a Microsoft collaborative platform and it allows you to exchange sort of data and work together and it allows for multiple users to go onto this platform. So when we're talking about NRT postage and that, so my mem my team members from home are putting information on spreadsheets onto SharePoint and the people in the office are picking it up from that SharePoint access and are able to, you know, um, uh, communicate and send out whatever needs sending out. So it's a real good platform to have if you don't have it already. Um, so one to think about out there. I just put in something around the data because I was looking very quickly um, around a comparison really from last year's data to the numbers of who set a quit date in this month, sort of March, April. And as you can see, this year we've had 500, um, mainly in the month of March, that set a quit date. Um, so we're up from last year. But interestingly enough, my website hits have gone down. So um, compared to last year, we, are, we have less unique page views. Um, but I think I can put that down to, I think most people are just coming coming through the telephone, um, but that's something I'm going to dig into later on. So in terms of lessons learned then, um, what I would say is telephone support is effective. I can quite confidently say that. Um, you know, the very earlier worries and concerns that we've had around, um, you know, not having that reliance on body language and cues and, you know, that kind of thing is no longer really a worry because I think it's amazing how much advisors and how much you pick up just through active listening. And I think really we need to give people the benefit of the doubt. People are very honest. When they smoke, they tell you, um, you know, um, and, and I suppose with the, the relationships that they build with the advisors over that 12 week and sometimes longer period, um, you know, it stands testament to the type of relationships that the advisors have with these clients that they feel that they can be honest with you. So I think good advisor skills and knowledge allows for that transparency. We've seen that our loss to follow up rates, and I come from conventional stop smoking services where loss to follow up rates can be quite a lot higher. But I found that with this service, with it being digital, with it being telephone support, you're more likely to get hold of people. So I think your loss to follow up rates will decline. Um, and I think that people are speaking to you when they're at work, during their lunch breaks, in the comfort of their own home. So it just makes it a lot more um, ac accessible to people. And having a good telephony platform system is a must really. Skype works, but even better platforms such as Microsoft 365 is now available. And we certainly using Microsoft 365 um, for certain meetings and, and, and that kind of thing and and it and it works it, it does. So just a few more tips then, some practical tips. I think when you're speaking to people, make sure you're getting more than one contact number, a landline, mobile, and possibly an email. So if you don't get hold of them, you can um, email them, et cetera. Um, having texting facilities, um, either built into your patient management system or separate systems such as text local. We find that if we can't get hold of people, you leave a message, but then when you text them, they are able to text back and they do text back, um, you know. So I think having good texting facilities but also when you're doing things like comms and you want to get a little bit more information I mean we do our survey data on a quarterly basis just a, a, a 
server survey um, and and we do it all via text local and it's a really good um, system to to think about having if you don't have one um, advisors we just say give out your direct dials it just makes it easier for people to get in touch rather than coming through to the main service number and also when you're posting out your nrt and e -cigs, put an, a, a return address on that envelope because a lot of the time you'll find if people are you know if if um, Royal Mail can't post it out to someone for whatever reason they return it back um, and you're not wasting products there and I can't say this often enough go paperless it saves time so if you are doing a digital support you've got patient management system in front of you you're speaking to a client the time it takes for people to put it on a monitoring farm, write out all that information, and then for you to go and upload all of that onto your patient management system is, is, is really a waste of time. So I think if you can go paperless and do it all on the system whilst you're talking to people, and my advisors will tell you, these are advisors who've been doing the job for like 16, 17 years, who've only done paper, you know, writing on paper, and they tell you if they can go paperless, anyone can. Um, so also web chat, we are um, slowly but surely embracing this more, um, especially when we speak into more than one member of a household, so pregnant woman, their partner and extended family members. I think it's just a good facility to have. I think it just makes it a lot more easier, um, you know, um, speaking to more than one person that way. And I think um, these current challenging times have forced people to embrace technology and become more tech savvy so i think we find that more and more people are open to the idea of um, setting up now web chat um, sort of appointments and and that kind of thing um, so i think that's also something that we should uh, look to embrace further and i think that is where i'm at really so that concludes Thanks my presentation so thank you for listening Thanks, Sahira. That's great. Um, we are going to move on now to Liz Fisher at um, Hertfordshire Council. Um, I've just noticed that we have um, uh, put the timings slightly askew on our uh, for this webinar. So we are probably going to run out past 12 o'clock to do the Q&A, um, I think. Um, so that's nothing to do with the speakers who are all doing excellently keeping to time. Um, but Liz is going to talk now about outreach activity, um, especially with primary care. You also got a name check, Hertfordshire, on the last um, webinar. So um, we'll, we'll hand over to you now to, to, uh, to tell you. us a little bit more have detail about Have you got my presentation up? Or have I... you have you got my presentation up? I've got your presentation if you want me to put it up um, rather, than, rather than it be just your for... slides. If that's easier, I just Liz. I not remember how to do it, Robbie. It's That's okay. okay. Let's, Should um, we do it from we, my? We, we can see your my... slides um, on the screen, Liz. You, so you can yeah, see yeah, my we, slides. Don't you? Yeah, okay. we see. So if if you want to just go full screen, um, which is the icon. Yeah, have you got it now? Um, I can see them, but it's not quite full screen. If if you go to slideshow at the top. There, there we go. go. Slide... Thanks, Liz. Yep, okay. Right, so here we go. I'm Liz Fisher, I'm head of um, Hertfordshire Health Improvement Service, but I'm also um, the tobacco control lead for Hertfordshire and um, the NHS health check lead, which will, the reason for telling you that will become apparent shortly. Um, so, um, um, that's it. Okay, so our response to um, COVID-19 really uh, was very much based on the emerging information um, on and the increased risk. So that early information from the NCSCT, uh, some of the other information coming out. And because we have, um, although smoking prevalence in Hertfordshire is only 12%, um, we do actually have 110,000 adult smokers in the county. So that's quite a significant number of adult smokers that we felt we could reach. And smokers already in our services were expressing concerns and how grateful that they were to already be um, going through the process of quitting um, and they were worried about the consequences. So we felt that there were, were definitely smokers out there who wanted more support and were motivated to quit. Um, 
So we seized the opportunity. We felt there was a very unique selling point that would encourage and motivate people. Um, and so we definitely wanted to encourage more, more smokers to quit. We had a unique selling point. We really wanted only a single message, and that was the Quit for COVID campaign. We tweaked it slightly uh, using the number four, um, and this is the key message that was was used um, everywhere. And I think we'd got um, had early discussions with our clinical commissioning groups and. Um, using the word your doctor would like you to stop smoking really helped with that motive some of that motivation and things we did so some of the background that enabled us to respond quickly is that the heart the health improvement services is indirectly employed by public health and the county council so we didn't have to go through another commissioner or through another organization we could respond very rapidly we immediately had the support of our director of public health and executive member for, for public health. They were on the case straight away and wanted to, us to do everything we possibly could. So there was no risk of redeployment of the staff elsewhere. They wanted us to make sure we were focusing and were able to um, respond. Um, all other service area um, uh, stopped. So health checks and MEC and tobacco control some of the inreach we were doing with um, our NHS trusts and the uh, and primary care stopped. Um, but also we then had flexibility of the staff budget because I managed the budget for, I managed the budget for primary care and um, that enabled me to shift some of the staff budget into the HHIS budget um, to enable us to respond and pay staff to do more hours um, in order to respond to this. And we already, because I managed the health check programme, I was able to redeploy those staff who are very experienced in stop smoking services as well. Um, to, and we could rapidly train um, some newly appointed staff that were appointed just at the point um, of COVID-19. And we used some very innovative ways to train those um, staff remotely. Um, we were lucky we already had a smart public health service all all the staff already worked um mo with mobiles phones laptops um and microsoft teams had just launched across the council so we could do lots of group work with with staff um we had remote it access um and we also had uh, were pa completely paperless we had a secure um database for all our stop smoking service information um we had text messaging service in place and we adapted that really quickly for the text for COVID message so we could identify where smokers were coming from and that, that was a unique text message to us. Uh, we had a single point of access that was, um, was available um, and we already had a Verenaclean um, electronic Verenaclean pathway in place where we could directly email to GPs um, and they could send electronic prescription requests directly to community pharmacies. And there's also a PGD in place. Um, and our NRT voucher scheme is also electronic. So we don't have to post anything. Uh, we can text or give the service user a unique code for their nicotine replacement therapy. And the pharmacy at the other end is able to plug in that um, code and supply the individual with their nicotine replacement therapy. And there was already systems in place where pharmacies were able to post or send um, nicotine replacement therapy to vulnerable groups. So that all helped, although it wasn't completely without um, problems. Um, so to start with, we did a smart survey with GPs and community pharmacies to understand their pressures and plans. What were they able to continue doing in terms of stop smoking services? And to be fair, most of the ones that responded were going to continue seeing their clients, but there were some because responses weren't 100 percent. We felt we needed to do something about that as well to make sure there was some cont continuity of care for clients in those services. Uh, we developed comms for midwives, CCGs, GPs, community pharmacies and the NHS Trust with whom we'd already got established referral pathways. So we wanted very much focus on where we knew we would win rather than trying to develop new referral pathways um, and we used the established com route, comms routes that we'd already got so we had a single call to action for smokers um, in terms of um, they could text or call 
quit for COVID to a single point of access and we shifted all of the service delivery to telephone services. Um, so we actually had to then suddenly increase our clinic hours because the demand was outstanding. Um, so what we had been doing up to then was 75 hours of face-to-face -face clinic per week. And we had to increase that by week six. So by last week, we had to change that to 206 hours of, of telephone support. So huge increase in the staffing requirement to do that. Um, and we identified the source of referrals to build on what was working. So most of the referrals we were getting were from that simple text that we had asked um, GPs to send out. And um, that really, really worked. Say the GPs texting their patients, using a single message um, and asking them just to search for all smokers. We'd um, started to um, develop a sort of priority with um, looking at how they could do individual searches on their clinical systems for smokers most at risk. So people with long term conditions or mental health conditions, those who might be shielded. But as soon as we introduced any sort of complexity where we're asking GPs to do anything other than a simple search for all smokers, we were advised that actually they probably wouldn't do it. So although we were then being very generic in encouraging all smokers, we felt it was the right approach um, because we would just reach that um, greater number. Um, so for all of the GPs that we have, we have 127 across Hertfordshire, about half have responded directly to this um, request to text patients. And what we've been doing is we've followed up individual reminders um, to GPs who haven't responded. Um, and we've been doing that in a phased approach because of the numbers that we've um, we've had through. We've had to, to try and manage the number of referrals because we've been getting too many. Um, and then we've been doing a thank you um, to the GPs who have, have done the research and given them feedback, but we've also given them information to put on their own Facebook pages and to remind them to continue to send um, direct referrals um, and we we did some really good media work earlier on. We had a, a press release and the press was very interested in what we were doing. Uh, that led to uh, radio interviews um, and Facebook. And we did Facebook and Twitter campaigns. Um, our exec member did a radio interview and we had a fabulous case study right from the start, very early on, who um, quit because she was shielded um, and was um, very articulate and was able to express very much why it was a worry to her, but also she was able to sound as if everybody else could do it because she had done it. Um, and that made a really good statement for the, for the press, I think. Um, Liz, so, I just have to um, ask you to speed up a little bit. That's fine. Um, we just made sure that um, nicotine replacement therapy and prescription medicine supply issues were addressed. So some of that was just um, supply issues because of COVID-19 um, and staff weren't familiar with the geography because they were working on a much wider geographical footprint. So these are the results. Um, we had 300 referrals within two weeks, 500 by week three and 852 self-referrals so motivated people who wanted to quit smoking. And we've had one sort of complaint, but it wasn't a real complaint. It was just curiosity more than anything. Um, and what we want to do next, this is final slide, is develop some wider comms and marketing, do a little bit more of a targeted approach to vulnerable smokers um, and use more case studies as they come through. We want to fully evaluate it um, and understand service users um, evaluation and do a bespoke evaluation for COVID-19. Um, and look at all the different delivery options in the future. I don't think we will ever go back to delivering just face-to-face -face, um, support. Smokers are telling us that this is just a much more flexible way for them. And of course, share the lessons learned. So thank you. Thanks, Liz. So interesting. And um, I'm really learning a lot from all the presentations today. And I hope everybody else is. Don't, we have way too many questions already to get through. But nonetheless, I encourage you to add more questions to the sidebar because we will answer them. If we don't answer them in the Q&A at the end, we will answer them um, uh, afterwards. So we're now going to move on to uh, Scott, Scott Chapman, who is the service manager at Living Well Smoke Free 
North Yorkshire. And Scott is going to talk about the provision of medications and adapting services to deliver through primary care in response to the current situation. So we can see your slides, Scott. So I will hand over to you. Yep. Are we ready? Great. That's that's brilliant. Thanks for handing over. Yeah. So as, as Hazel's mentioned, my name's Scott Chapman. I'm the, the service manager for Living Well Smoke Free and we cover uh, the North Yorkshire area as part of uh, North Yorkshire County Council. So obviously once the COVID pandemic started to kick off, we started to, to change practice following the guidance from the NCSCT. Uh, we'd already started to think about it pre prior to that. Um, but obviously once that came in, as everyone else did, we started to, to do no face-to-face, -face, obviously, and there was no CO readings. So obviously this, this meant that we were moving to, to working remotely. Um, it's not that unusual as a service for us to work remotely. We've only, we only have six advisors on the ground running the, the clinics, um, and obviously the six advisors trying to cover the biggest county in England. So yeah, working remotely is, is something that isn't new to the staff. Um, we've always had a remote option, but we try to encourage people, obviously, as often as possible to come in and do face to face. So we quickly had to switch from the face to face into to offering a remote service, mainly over the telephone. And um, we have got other platforms that we use as a council, but as yet we haven't developed then within the service. We're just we're sticking to, to phone telephone support for the minute. But there are plans to try and develop that a little bit more. Uh, so we, we went about offering this remote support. And obviously, as we started to do it, we started to encounter a few practice issues uh, that needed to be addressed to ensure that we could to keep the service operational and keep offering people the support to stop smoking. So there's probably four main things that we developed, and I will move through them and try and discuss them a little bit more in, in detail. Um, so usually the service is offered face-to-face, um, -face, like I've already mentioned, and from there people will get a, um, a paper voucher to take, following the consultation, to take to the, the pharmacy to redeem for their medication. Um, obviously that was going to be a problem now because we couldn't see them face-to-face -to, -face to give them it, and obviously they couldn't then take it to the pharmacy. So we usually offer a paper voucher. We just did a, an editable PDF electronic voucher we had developed within the council so that we could basically send that voucher directly to the pharmacy via a secure email um, address for them to just basically receive at one end and to dispense um, at their end to the, the person who was, was quitting smoking. That was, it's been well received by the majority of, of primary care and, and pharmacies. We've kept the standard paper vouchers that we usually use um, as not all the pharmacies wanted to go um, to the electronic voucher. So some of them still preferred the, the paper voucher and doing it like the manual way. Um, but yeah, it was well received by a lot of the pharmacies and obviously the majority of, of people that we're seeing now are benefiting from this editable PDF voucher. Um, initially, just out of quickness, we just we did one voucher. We do have a mid voucher as well that we also use for anyone who wants to change products. Um, that hasn't been changed to a, a PDF e voucher yet, but that's in the process now because obviously we want to give people the most options as, as, as possible. Um, we started to see once we, we got into to, to work in the pockets of primary care, we're unable to, to continue supporting smokers due to various reasons. So there was capacity issues, there was obviously prioritization of work. Um, so we, we got some partnership working going with primary care and kept open the regular lines of communication. So we, we started to go out and ask them how they were doing, if they had any problems, if we could help them. And from that, we found that we might need the issue of or address the issue of, of transferring care um, into our service. So for primary care providers who couldn't necessarily keep up seeing people for stop smoking purposes, we wanted to give them the option if they could to, to send those people into our service so we could carry on their their care. So we just worked up, we, we did some discussions and with primary care, we, we worked out a transfer of care agreement, um, which allows us as a service to pick up the care of smokers who were being seen before COVID um, by primary care providers. So basically with following consent and consent from the smoker, uh, primary care will provide us with some basic details, which would allow us to contact um, the person who was receiving support so we could reinstate their medication supply and continue the behavioural uh, support on a, on a remote capacity. So that, that, that worked quite well. Um, we've carried on that communication with primary care because obviously there are ongoing issues and the levels of, of work and, and capacity are going up and down. Um, so we're in regular 
contact with them to make sure that if they have got any problems or they're struggling to see new clients then the option is there to transfer them into our service using the, the transfer of care form so that we can pick that up and carry on care for people so they're not missing out on on treatment to stop smoking so that's quite important so the third adaption adaptation sorry we made was it was a bit of partnership working i can't take the credit for this this was the council in general so north yorkshire county council started to look into some partnership working involving the district councils in our area um a few nhs organizations um a few voluntary sect um organizations and a, commu a few community organizations so for people who are isolating and shielding and obviously unable to leave home and they didn't really have family or friends that could go out and collect medications for them, they're the types of people who would benefit from this specific arrangement. So what would happen in that instance is they'd be seen by the, our advisor as they would normally and then our, our stop smoking advisor would contact the partnership agency and try and find out the local involved service for that particular area. And then they'd be put in contact from the, the Living Well Smoke Free Advisor. And then that would be arranged between the volunteers that would then go along to the pharmacy, following all the social distancing and adhering to all the health and safety regulations, pick up the medication, deliver it to the door. So that allowed no break in the support for that particular client. Um, and there was obviously a reduced re uh, risk of relapse because of that. So yeah, that was a, that's worked out really well for us because we have got a lot of people, obviously with it being quite remote, who struggle to get out. Um, they don't have people directly around them to um, to help them out with that, so they would benefit from that um, particular arrangement. So that was that was a good piece of, of work that was initiated by the council. Um, there is one more that we we decided to do. We made like a remote offer sheet. So for people who came into the service, but following conversations, it was it was clearly obvious that they couldn't necessarily access the service as there wasn't a service close enough, or they couldn't maybe access the pharmacy. We just decided to summarise the remote offer for people, so we could offer them a service. Although it would mean them showing a bit of initiative and maybe paying for their own products, etc. We tried to link them into what was available nationally. And obviously, we linked in a lot of the quit for COVID um, communications that have gone out. We basically summed up what options people had to access help and support if they couldn't directly access our service. So that's worked out quite well for people who are unable to directly be involved with the service uh, at the minute. So I think in terms of how this will help, the four things that we've we've done and the four things that we've changed, I'm hoping they'll all stay. When we go back and consider the um, the editable PDF e-voucher, that's something that's been really well received. So hopefully we can continue that. I mean, generally things like that can take a little bit of time to develop, but with the pressure that we had to keep the service going, luckily the people we, we worked with in the council uh, managed to do that quite quickly so we've got that off the ground and obviously that's been really uh, really well received um so we're hoping to carry that on and we're hoping as we go the majority of primary care providers um will use the e-vouchers rather than the paper side of things um the transfer of care again we don't know what's going to happen people might have pockets of, of time when they can't offer a service as much so there that can stay so that primary care can transfer patients into our service so we can pick them up and continue their care i'm not sure about the council's partnership working and obviously having those volunteers um to deliver stuff for us that was something that was thought up in response to the COVID pandemic that was going on hopefully the council will see the benefits of that and that'll stay on which would mean that obviously we could use that going forward and we could offer that service of sort of delivery um using volunteers to ensure people can still get access to medications so in terms of a service we haven't seen a massive increase in in numbers or extra numbers since since this the covid scenario um started but we have seen an increased um percentage of people that we're able to contact so yeah we, we are using the telephone support we're contacting people a lot more we're obviously getting people on the phone a little bit more and they tend to be engaging a little bit better so that's a, a very positive thing um it's also highlighted the more committed smokers so the ones that are obviously currently engaging with the service are the ones that obviously want to be here, the ones to quit, that are a little bit more dedicated. It's obviously that makes it a little bit easier for everyone. Um, yeah, but we've made those adapt adaptations. The services continue to offer everything that it usually does. Um, and it's been quite a successful period. We've, we've learned quite a lot from it and we're hoping to keep the four things that we've developed as a minimum uh, still involved in the service so that we can operate it um, and use them in the, in the future. 
So yeah, that's Thanks. everything from my side of things. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. I, I think it's really what I think is so inspiring from the presentation so far is the, the, the where people have found opportunities in, in what is sort of difficult and emergency circumstances is just very inspiring. So moving on last, but by no means least, um, Dan Priest from Plymouth City Council. So Dan is going to, to talk with us about an issue which I know many people have contacted us about and are interested in how we could be doing this um, a bit better. So supporting smokers with complex needs being housed in emergency com um, accommodation. Um, Dan, we can't quite see your screen just yet, but hopefully we will be able to shortly. Here we go. Right over to you, you then, Dan, for the last presentation. Hi, thank you, Hazel. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's my end, but my audio is dropping in and out a bit, so um, I'm, I'm going to work through it. But if, if, I, if I lose you, just if someone message, you, message me, is me or something like that would be good. Um, so yeah, I'm Dan Priest from uh, Plymouth City Council, um, and I've got 10 minutes to talk to you about uh, the work we've been doing on e-cigs. Um, it's a bit different doing it like this, but I'm kind of I'm applying the principle that um, I've survived a family uh, quiz on Zoom, so I can I can do anything. Um, I'm going to spend 10 minutes now talking to you about why I think e-cigs um, should be a fundamental priority for uh, public health and how we've responded uh, during the COVID um, crisis. Um, I think I'm going to pick up the kind of the, the, um, the sort of subtext that all the speakers have touched on really is the disruptive influence of, um, of the sort of current circumstances um, and, and kind of think about the disruption that potentially I think it, our job in public health is to allow e-cigs to, to be disruptive um, to, to what we do. So, um, so my kind of starting point during the um, during the current sort of situation was was um, was looking at the evidence. Um, I think uh, we'd done some work previously with e-cigs, and when when COVID nineteen outbreak sort of broke, first of all, I kind of thought this is going to be something I'm going to need to pick up afterwards um, initially, to be honest. And then uh, the tweet that's up there from from Sharon Cox really kind of opened my eyes, and 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 uh, there's a there's a link to the to the article in the BMJ there really, uh, really opened my eyes to the point that um, although e-cigs could be important in the long term, uh, also it's something that we really need to be doing now in terms of reducing risks linked with um, COVID-19. I'm not going to go on too much about the sort of smoking and COVID-19 uh, uh, evidence because we've heard a lot about that. But I mean, basically, just to say that in uh, the world of uh, complex needs, the risks that exist uh, um, in relation to COVID-19 are kind of exponential in, in, the, in the complex needs world. So the, the risk of um, transmission through the sort of action of smoking um, is greater in people with complex needs, partly because they've got higher rates of smoking also because they're more likely to be sharing or picking up uh, no bends, um, um, discarded no bends. And also the risk of further complications is greater in this in this group because the conditions which put people vulnerable to uh, further complications from uh, COVID-19 are obviously over uh, represented in this group. Things like serious asthma, uh, COPD and conditions like that are more prevalent in the group of uh, people that we're, we're talking about when we're talking about people um, who live, who have complex needs, who lead more marginalised lives. Um, so the other, the other key thing I took up from the evidence that's on those links there is the, the uh, in in relation to uh, vaping, um, and that really the, the the sort of summary of that really, and the key takeaway from that evidence for me is that there's no evidence that e-cigarettes increase the transmission risk, but there are some sensible things that people who are vaping can do to reduce their potential risk, like don't share uh, vapes um, and use low powered devices. Um, and there's other tips there that are in those links on those on, on that on that um, that slide there. So um, might be worth checking out. But just to sort of summarize this slide, um, we know that smoking tobacco increases risks associated with COVID-19. And I think it's especially important for people with complex needs and e-cigarettes give us a sort of a, a, a ability to kind of apply a laser focus to this to these increased risks. So we had previously done some work with e-cigarettes and people with complex needs and we we'd sort of run a small pilot project in a, in a hostel in, in Plymouth 
uh, which was really a learning exercise for us. Um, and we, we helped, we um, provided e-cigs to, to a small group of people living in this hostel. And then we, we used the appreciative inquiry method to, uh, to talk to them afterwards about, about their lives and their smoking and, and vaping. Um, personally, this was, a, was, was transformative for me, the things I learned here. Uh, we, I learned numerous things from talking to people about their experiences. Um, and two, two things that jumped out really, uh, but there were many more, were that um, people really appreciated the autonomy that offering them an e-cig helps them to create. And I think that the autonomy they felt made their kind of um, uh, uh, success rate, you know, improve their chances of succeeding in terms of cutting down uh, smoking. And the other thing uh, that, they, that this, this project taught me was that the way the offer was framed and, um, and presented to the people who we were talking, talking to was absolutely key. And what I mean by that is we kind of used a relational kind of process. So we identified people who'd already got a relationship with people in these hostels um, to, to sort of lead the, lead the, lead the, uh, the offer. Uh, and then we brought in um, experts from the vape, local vape shop to provide instruction and, and a kind of motivational um, session with people. Um, two things that developed from that pilot that, that in, in, in hindsight proved really important were the, um, the the clients reported mutual support networks so they started talking about helping each other to kind of continue to vape and overcome the early hurdles because vaping is it's quite complicated it's quite different to smoking um, and and there's a sort of um, uh, there are some te techniques that need to be learned so the people in this uh, in these group in these hostels started to help each other, which was really great to see, mutual support developing. And then uh, another kind of unintended consequence that I hadn't anticipated, but again, proved really important, was uh, reported back to us the, 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 the drop in sharing cigarettes uh, and, and picking up knob ends, um, really uh, for people who started to vape, that, 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 that sort of practice effectively stopped overnight. Um, and what this, Kind of exercise we did this last november and what it really highlighted to me was was the need for an open-ended unconditional and easy offer for um for people uh, to take up vaping so as i said when the when the covid19 um, outbreak sort of um uh, started uh, it um the need for this for this became more apparent so um basically uh, I've been asked to talk about, we, we sort of developed a, a pretty quickly and remotely developed a sort of um, operation, if you like, to, to get these to get these e-cigs in the right place. So, and this involved um, these, these, these sort of four or five things. So procurement from a local vape shop, uh, and that was based on the, that, that procurement was on the basis that um, there's a local vape shop in Plymouth that's got the buy with confidence accreditation, which is a sort of stamp from the trading standards department of um, um, uh, compliance with all the regulations and the laws. Uh, so that, that helped with the procurement and that made it simpler and quicker really, because that identified one place that was potentially uh, gonna be able to provide the, the E6. Um, we then developed a specification for the starter kit, which I've put up there and that Orca solo kit apparently is, uh, is a perfect um, um, e -cig for somebody who's just starting out uh, vaping. Um, and then it was about assessing the, the need or the demand. So we, I didn't really have an idea about how many people were in, this, in these categories. We wanted to identify people who were being housed um, under the kind of emergency uh, um, rehousing re policy of the city. Uh, and so we went with that. We went to our, um, an organization in Plymouth called the Complex Needs Alliance, which is a, uh, an alliance of uh, all the organizations that, that, that have, um, provide housing services and other services to people with complex needs who lead marginalized lives. And that identified a handful of organizations in the city who were, who were involved with this rehousing of um, homeless people and people who were already living in hostel accommodation. So that enabled conversations with those people enabled us to, um, to identify what the need was. And then, um, and then we needed to talk to the vape shop. So we made contact with our, our local vape shop. We had some really uh, we'd already made contact with them rather so with that when we did this pilot but we developed that um that relationship uh, and we had some really helpful 
input from the vape shop in terms of um, techni technically what we needed to be providing. And the vape shop also produced, because they couldn't give a face-to-face -face, um, uh, session for people in terms of how to use these, these vapes like they would do over the counter normally. They produced like a handout for us that we could, a simple one sheet handout that we can provide um, to the organisations that we that we'd link with. Um, so I think there's two things out of that that jump to jump out of that all that the sort of developing the supply chain. The key thing for this developing this supply chain was the relationships that we developed. So the, the the reason for the procurement and the specification really was to help us develop a kind of working relationship with the right people. And the two relationship well the two relationships that were crucial for this were the vape shop and the uh, the coordinators in the in the various um, um, housing associations and organisations. And it, uh, those coordinators were, were the people who were first of all identifying the numbers of people that we needed to uh, contact, and also then involved with distribution of the e-cigs. And it was them that was helping this kind of providing this mutual support. And the other thing I'll add is I think I think um, person from Leicestershire County Council said that their um, the, these e-cigs are available by post. So there was no face to face. The shops closed in Plymouth, but they do offer a postal. Um, they post these e-cigs out, so that was useful. So um, just to summarize, summarize really, um, I think sort of conceptually, this is useful to look through a marketing lens, to be honest. Um, e-cigs are already a successful product. and They already reach millions of people. I think our job in public health is to improve the access to extend the marketing to, marketing to a group <coughs> of people who it doesn't normally reach through overcoming the sort of the barriers of um, access and price. Um, the other thing I sort of say is that this was different and it was in addition to the to the existing stop smoking support offer. So there were, were there were you know this stop smoking support in Plymouth is available and uh, in, in along similar lines to, to uh, things that we've heard already like uh, telephone support and online support. So what we have seen is an increase what you may expect we've seen an increase in switching from smoking to vaping um, much less sharing of cigarettes in this key group who as i say are more likely to be needing to kind of shield because of their um, pre-existing health condition so we are seeing much less sharing cigarettes um, one of the people in the in the uh, one of the housing associations said we did we were literally crying out for this sort of thing we've been talking to people about stopping sharing cigarettes for ages but not really getting anywhere. And the provision of an E6 really helped help with that. And we're seeing less smoking um, um, and obviously linked with that less risk related to COVID-19. I think the thing I'll end on is a, is a thing I had yesterday in an email that, that was somebody that told me this fantastic thing that clients are now in, these, uh, in this emergency accommodation are actually persuading the staff to stop, some, to, to cut down on smoking and to start vaping. So to me, that's that's a real brilliant outcome. That's really kind of what we're all about, in my opinion. More than that, can you, Dan? Pardon? Thank you. You can't ask for more than that. I don't think. Thank you. That no, was no, that's great. Really, really interesting. And um, uh, I, we are going to share the presentations. The person who's just asked that question, and the, this recording will also be available afterwards as well. So we've got sort of ten minutes for questions. Uh, if I can ask all of the speakers to um, switch their audio back on. Um, and uh, we have had lots of questions and please keep adding questions uh, to the to the question bar um, even, even though we won't get to them all because I, I think the discussions following this will continue to be really important. One of the questions which has come up repeatedly across um, people's presentations in different forms is the sort is how we are going to you know, validate people's um, quit success in this new remote world, and and how we're gonna how we're gonna go about doing that. So maybe I might start with you here. Presumably, this was something that yeah. you have looked at already within your service, given that it was established prior to um, to the emergency needed to be remote. Yeah, sure. Um, validation is always the golden question, isn't it? Um, so with uh, Leicestershire, in terms of um, obviously being a digital service, you cannot validate carbon monoxide readings over the phone. So um, it is based on self-report, um, so self-reported quitters. However, 
um, the face-to-face -face contact visits with pregnant women and with, uh, you know, mental health service users, et cetera, um, those uh, service users are CO validated. Um, and I suppose it just comes down to the commissioner and the stance that public health takes within your local authority. That's a decision that we made as a local authority. Um, that we would we would go with self-report um, because we're a digital service and there's there's no way around that. Although that said, I have to say that we do host carbon monoxide clinics um, within community settings, i.e. within GP surgeries. I mean, you know, just go into a GP surgery, um, you know, for over two hours a week or something like that and if anyone who's had telephone support wanted the option of validating their um, carbon monoxide readings then they can come into those sort of CO clinics and do that um, so it's an option it's not uh, an obligation or mandatory but it's something that's out there for those people who want that validation um, so so there is that offer. Linda is it something that you've looked at in Newcastle? Yes, I think I, I would agree with what's been said. I mean, during this period, um, uh, you know that th that's no option. It's we have to do that, and we would we would certainly uh, try. Um, but going forward, I think um, you know thinking of the tools in the box and perhaps you know how we're going to do that at distance and how we actually um, you know gain data even from the use of apps is um is co is complex but i think certainly for the moment in time we need to go with um just self reported yeah a few people sort of adding to the conversation in the question bar as well so um somebody reminding me that there is a, a currently a trial in manchester using hosting carbon monoxide monitors which can be used with smartphones which i think will be really interesting although uh, probably a bit expensive currently for most services um, and also a suggestion of sort of utilising community pharmacy, perhaps, in the future, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, I don't know if any, do any of the other speakers want to add anything to that discussion around kind of validating quits and different approaches? Hey, so it's Liz here. I would just say yeah. that at the moment, the um, carbon monoxide monitoring is banned. So yes. it might well be some time after COVID-19 that we even consider CO validation. Yeah, I do think that it's something we yeah. will come back to as we, we will do future events, I think, as we move towards recovery and thinking about how we might get um, address some of these um, questions around things like carbon monoxide screening in, in our new normal. Um, okay, right, gosh, there's so many questions, it's hard to know where to go next. There's been quite a few questions around hosting of NRT and, and kind of questions about how to do that effectively, and whether there are issues around security and reliability. Um, who would be best to answer some questions on that? Um, I can come in again, Hazel. Oh, Zahiria. <laughs> um, Zahiria. Um, I think that's why we've made the decision that, to, I mean, not only do we hold our own stock, whether that be e-cigarettes or NRT within the county hall, within the council building, um, I think that was also the decision we made in terms of advice, the, the team A going in and posting out um, NRT. Now, I mean, I... I'm part of a, quite a large council. We've got a post room, etc. We have not to date, thankfully, um, and I'm talking, what are we, three years in now, um, had any issues around theft or, um, you know, NRT. There, there has been some NRT that's gone astray, but nothing that's of too much of a concern, um, you know, like I said, putting your return address um, on the NRT, somehow that NRT makes its way back to you. So we've not had really any issues. And the fact that it's first class delivery, usually they get it the next day. And when you check in on them um, in the second week, third week, etc., cetera, um, people confirm that they've received it. Sending your e cigs registered post, um, you know, they, Royal Mail will not be able to deliver it until it gets a signature. So that's that's, that's again a consideration I said if you are posting out <clears throat> excuse me NRT um, then send your starter packs uh, or kits via registered post I hope that's answered the question that's great thank you um does anybody else have anything they would want to add to, to any of them can I just yeah, Martin, in go on. There. So, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, just because this question's come up quite a lot over the last yeah. uh, couple of weeks, certainly on the back of the, the webinar that we had the other uh, the other week. I guess the in terms of legality and kind of staying within the, the regulations, colleagues won't be surprised to know there's nothing specific on NRT supply and posting stuff out, but there are general rules and regulations that apply to um, non-prescription medicines. And essentially the two things that we're most concerned about or kind of need to make sure that we're adhering to is that uh, where the NRT is being stored, uh, if it's not being sent out directly from a pharmacy, if it's going from a pharmacy, that's fine, whether it's in the post or hand delivered. But if it's being bought direct supply, it needs to be stored securely in a, a relevant business setting. Uh, and that can be a stop smoking service, children's center, as long as it's got secure storage facilities. I think the one thing we need to get away from is um, uh, staff having stocks of supply at home <laughs> that they're then physically sending out with them. So I think the, the model that's here was spoke about uh, like having a hub center where staff can send this, the, these products out from is, is, is good. Um, and the second consideration, uh, and the question that's come up before is, is whether um, NRT can be taken out of its outer packaging to make it easier to post. And unfortunately, having discussed this with colleagues, that there are quite tight regulations about not tampering with products. And I know one might, not, one might argue that just taking it out of one packaging might not constitute tampering. The, the advice that we've been given is that we shouldn't be removing products from its outer packaging. Thanks, Martin. I, I, that's very helpful clarification. Um, we've got a few questions about e-cigarettes, um, um, as there always is, I think. Um, uh, something particularly about <coughs> buy-in from elective members around the use of e-cigarettes. Dan, uh, did you have any kind of issues, any pushback across the council around the, the, the role of e-cigarettes with this population? Or well, have we lost you, Dan? Oh, that's a shame. Um, uh, oh, oh, hello. I'm jumping in and out, I think. So let me know by message, maybe you. if you can't okay. hear this, but you can hear. I can't hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So briefly, I mean, one of the things I could say in context, set in the context, was that we have got a, um, um, we've got a position from our health and wellbeing board on uh, vaping and e-cigarettes, which is basically in in line with Public Health England's kind of um view of um you know maximizing the benefit and uh, mitigating the risks so we we've got a lot of support yeah politically uh, from our portfolio holder and from the director of public health to this approach thanks dan um others who are using e-cigarettes um uh, i feel like i come into leicestershire a lot and i do apologies um but we had a specific question about whether you're using it as a first line or, or following it using it as a follow-up around if people don't it's, want nrt or or champions yeah it's it's used as first line um yep. so it it comes down to informed choice um in terms of obviously all the treatment options are explained to people when they call up um but if that's what they want to use then they you know they they're more than welcome to use it so it's definitely first line um some people even have an e -cig and then maybe have like um you know a supplementary product in terms of nrt so a patch or a gum or whatever it is that they want to use so we do that um, and consider it a combination therapy so yeah definitely first line right i'm good we've got lots of questions and we're going to come back to all of you after this event but i think we'll just close by asking the same question of each of the speakers um today uh, and I, I wondered if you could tell me what's the one thing that you have changed as a response to covid that you would be most keen to retain uh when we um get back to normality um and i'll start with um i'll start with dan and we'll work backwards um through the uh through the agenda so dan what's the one thing that you would would hope to retain from what you've changed yeah a great question thanks hazel um i think it's the uh, the scaling up of an unconditional offer of an e electronic cigarette um to people in these in these uh, in it, who, who are marginalized and uh, with complex needs um i think there's a, there's quite a lot of evidence to show that when people start switching from smoking to vaping it's not, not something they do um in the time scale of a kind of four week like a four week quit it you know generally it's a longer longer term uh uh, more complex kind of process and I think the unconditional nature of this offer 
enables us to embrace that complexity really brilliant thanks dan scott same question um, I think for me, it would be the electronic voucher. Um, I think using it with everyone with primary care, it just makes everything more convenient. It just makes the whole the whole process a lot more efficient. Just feel, It just feels more streamlined. And I think it just adds a little bit of extra sort of security to, to primary care when we're using the electronic vouchers. Thanks. Liz? Um, I think the flexibility of support um, for service users, making sure there's a range of options um, for individuals um, and looking at how we market services to, to promote that that range of services um, and I think we'd also look at online um, postage so using online pharmacies for the delivery of NRT I think that's probably something we'll look at rather than hosting ourselves but um, that's just something going forward I think. Thank you. Zira, I don't know if you've changed anything. <laughs> I was going to say it's a tough one. Um, I think a lot we are already doing, but there's one area that I want to explore more and, um, you know, just want um, to develop more is around the web chat support um, mm. and looking at how we expand mm. that further with both uh, the mm. Stop Smoking Service and Weight Management Services. Yeah. I yeah, think that, that sounds very interesting. Linda. Yeah, the yes. last word. I actually, I actually was absolutely going to say what Zahir has just said. I absolutely agree with it. I think this, uh, this has been an odd kind of opportunistic, you know, experience, and the lessons that you learn and the the quick use of technology and live chat and thing, I think offers a lovely doorway into another kind of, you know, or a more enhanced model, not another model, but just perhaps mm. a more enhanced model of provision that I think is really interesting. And I'm going to go for that really big style. Well, I think it's it's exciting in lots of ways what, what things we might do differently. Martin, do you have anything, any reflections you want to add from listening to all of these fantastic examples this morning? Just really blown away by the, the flexibility that people have mentioned and the ingenuity. Because we've heard examples there about um, e-cigarettes and being more flexible about that, looking at specific targeted communities, whether that be NHS staff or, or more at-risk populations, and just how people are making this work in their in their own situation. I know that we've spoken, Hazel, about um, what we could do nationally to, mm -hmm. to make sure that we do learn from this and to look yeah. at um, what's worked really well during this period. Once once we have a little bit more time to kind of reflect on it and how we can use that nationally uh, moving forward so that we take we take something positive from this, from this experience. Yeah, yeah thanks, Martin. And people keep, keep giving us feedback on what you want us to be sharing with you at this time. We're going to keep running some regular webinars. Uh, as I say, we'll look to do something with the NCSCT on the guidance, something on the evidence base with UCL, um, but also some questions coming through around kind of revisiting what people are doing around their communication strategies at the moment. I certainly think that would be a useful thing to look at. Um, so keep asking us questions and um, telling us about the things that you want more information on and uh, we will we'll see what we can do. Um, we'll send an evaluation form round after this, we'll send the slides round and the recording and some of the other um, products that have been mentioned, um, but if there's anything else that you want then do let us know. Um, thanks everybody and um, stay safe and we'll um, reconvene at a future date with another webinar. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.